this is a broad question, but mm -hmm. there's still some people out there that just don't understand. So, um, why exploring Mars is so important for the mankind? There's two different ways to, to answer that. There's two different ways to think about why do we explore Mars. One of them is the, for the human spirit, we have this great need to explore just built into us. If you look at human history, it's all about going to new places and trying new things. Um, and it's a very international activity. Most of our spacecraft missions, even the ones that are done by one country, like the US's NASA programs, we have international team of scientists, we get instruments contributed from all around the world, and we all have to learn to work together to operate these spacecraft, and so that's an important aspect of it as well. Um, but scientifically, it's really, uh, Mars can teach us a lot about how do planets form and how do they change over time, and we can take lessons from what has happened to Mars, and it can help us understand what's happened on Earth. So there's this uh, one, some of the, the planetary geology community, they're called comparative planetologists, and they look at, you know, if you want to understand volcanoes, well, what happens if you have a different kind of atmosphere, a different atmospheric pressure, different amount of gravity, what does that do to a volcanic eruption? That's not something that's easy to study in a lab, um, but you can get a first, some of the first thoughts about what what those effects might be by looking at a planet. It's, it's like a planet is like a natural laboratory. Yeah. And so Mars has a certain set of characteristics, but the same fundamental geological processes happen on it as happen on the Earth. And so you can do comparisons that way. Yeah. All right, um, second question. In uh, Mars Trilogy, have you read it? I haven't read all of it. I've uh, read the first book. Yeah. <laughs> I've read Red Mars, yeah. but I haven't read the others, unfortunately. No, okay. <laughs> but, um, in, in Mars Trilogy, Kim uh, Sidney Robson talks about how mankind could manage to, um, to create an atmosphere and even oceans uh, on Mars by using technology. So, how realistic or far fetched is that? Um, there is a lot of water locked up as ice. We think we've found very thin, very occasional possible flows of maybe it's salty water, briny water, um, that uh, we've, we've seen these features around certain parts of the planet. But the amount of, of water and carbon dioxide that you're talking about to form an atmosphere, um, it's it's hard to find, and then it, it's also so the the technology to make those huge changes. Um, I I don't think we have that technology yet. And then there's the question of how long do you want it to stay around? And if you're talking about a short period of time, that's more plausible. If you're I'll talking start. about I, you know, well, if you're talking about geological time, yeah, if you're talking okay. about billions of years, yeah. you know, hundreds of millions to billions of years. Well, there's a reason why Mars lost its atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We think Mars used to have a very thick atmosphere. We think um, like maybe four and a half billion years ago, Mars's atmosphere was much thicker. The whole planet may have been warmer and wetter, and that um, might be the co uh, that might explain some of the features we see uh, on some of the more ancient trains on Mars. But Mars has a low gravity. Mars does not have a magnetic field, and so uh, um, the magnetic field protects the atmosphere from the solar wind mm -hmm. and gravity helps hold on to the molecules and so um, what we think happened at Mars is that the solar wind stripped off some of the atmosphere uh, that it was easier to strip off certain things because of the lower gravity um, and we actually have a spacecraft at Mars right now it got there last fall it's called MAVEN and it's studying the atmosphere so it's looking at the ratios of different uh, different components of the atmosphere to try and trace back what's the history of the atmosphere. So is this picture of the evolution of Mars's atmosphere the right one? So as a geologist, I'm like, yeah, you could, you know, if you come up with some kind of technology, but you're not, you could maybe make an atmosphere, but you're not going to be able to keep it. Um, but maybe I'm thinking on time scales that are a bit longer than what the um, terraforming Mars people are really talking about. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree. <laughs> All right, and um, this is a large discussive topic, 
uh, meet a lot of the person, the person along the way. But um, do you believe life on Earth started on Mars? You know, that's a good question. I um, I did have a professor once who talked about how he thought maybe uh, the conditions on early Mars were actually better for the the start and the evolution of very early life than on Earth. I don't know. I think I think it's. It's, it feels a little implausible to me, so small probability, but at the same time I do think that the conditions on early Earth were so similar to the conditions on early Mars that it seems more likely to me that life did evolve on both planets. If we understand how early life worked on the Earth, um, it seems like there could have been a brief period of time when life could have started on Mars as mm -hmm. well. Uh, but it had to either go underground or die off completely uh, for compared, you know, as, as Mars changed into what it is today. Um, and that's actually one of the goals of the rover that I work for. It's the Mars 2020 rover. It's going to be our next big rover that, that NASA is sending to Mars. And we are going to carry instruments that will look for signs in the rock record that um, they're called biosignatures, and it's basically little indications that life was once there. Um, we are not going to be looking for life there today. We sure. don't have those sorts of instruments unless it, you know, you, walked up and waved at us. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we're, we're going to look for the traces in the rocks that life has to have left behind. Um, and then we are also going to be uh, drilling cores putting cores of rock in tubes and leaving the tubes on the surface of Mars and hoping that a follow-on mission, should anybody choose to fund it, a follow-on mission could come and collect those cores and bring them back to the Earth to, to analyze in terrestrial labs and, and really get at the question of was there ever life on Mars. Yeah, it's going to be huge. Yeah, it's, it's really very exciting to me to be part of this, this first step. We've wanted to do sample return from Mars for decades. Uh, there's so much more that we can learn when we get these rocks into the into the laboratories that we have here on Earth, and so it's really exciting to me to be part of that first step. Um, in this path, uh, what are the major challenges of the space exploration in the coming years? Funding is always always an issue. Um, you know, when we talk to people about what we do, and everybody gets so excited, and then they want us to. They were like, "Oh, you should send." You know, we should go back to Venus, we should spend more time looking at the outer solar system. And there are people inside of NASA and I'm sure, you know, ESA and all the other space agencies that are out there who want to do all these things, but it really, it comes down to, to money. And we, we just don't have the money to do everything we want to do. Um, and so that's to, to sort of have the, the political will to do these things and to put the money behind it. Um, and it would be nice, there's technology that it would be great to, to um, invest in designing for getting to the outer solar system faster, for longer lived spacecraft, um, next generation of power sources for some of our spacecraft. All of these things would be uh, really great to have. Um. A few days ago, many ufologists began to say that Curiosity has found evidence of a spaceship on Mars. A, a Star Destroyer from Star Wars. <laughs> Not I think it's like a movie tie-in. <laughs> yeah. So, um, how NASA and its staff received this sort of claim? Is there some internal process of investigation and a team to explain those images to the lay people? We have, uh, we have outreach people who um, you know, they're the ones who are behind all of our social media, and so they're the ones behind the Twitter account. They look at every question that comes in, and when they get a lot of questions about something, they will come to the science team and and uh, craft a, like, what, what does the science team think of this, and write a response. Um, but there's a lot, you know, our brains are wired to see patterns in things, and it's it's a byproduct of, it's part of why we're so successful as a species. Um, that's why we weren't eaten by tigers, because we could, we could spot them in the brush. And so we do have a tendency to, to 
imagine that we see things, we see patterns that aren't there in, in especially the Mars images, people love to do that. And so um, there's, it kind of has to rise above a certain level of interest. There's always this low level like, oh, I see a door into the dune <laughs> and... Uh, standing moon. Yeah, yeah, and like the spoon or yeah. something. And I've, you know, there's, there's uh, honestly, if we ever do find any evidence of aliens, uh, we will be the we will be shouting it from the rooftops. You will we will be so excited. You will not be able to shut us up about it. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you.